One question we're going to try to answer today here on the show. Are the Sabres tough enough? Let's explore that. Coming back here on the Locked On Sabres podcast. Your Locked On Sabres, your daily podcast on the Buffalo Sabres. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thanks for making Locked On Sabres your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Sneaky Joe DiBiase here on the show. Today's episode brought to you by Indeed. Indeed knows when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Visit Indeed.com slash Locked On to start hiring now. Terms and conditions apply. The Sabres win 4-2 to in their home finale, the final game of the year, fan appreciation night, 4-2 to over the Washington Capitals. We'll talk about the game. We'll talk about the brawl that I'm willing to call a brawl that happened at the end of the night. I've got some Sabres of my awards of my own to give away. The Sabres did that yesterday with their Rico Award and some other stuff. I've got the Sorties. Again, coming back, I realized all year, I've been calling our texters in our text line, our sorties. And then I went back to last year's episode. Like, what did I call the awards I did at the end of last year? And then I got there and realized, wait a minute, I called that the sorties too. So we can't have that being both. So we're going to have to find a new name for our texters or we're going to just call them the texters uh, going forward. So if you want to sign up for that, by the way, and if you're not already a subscriber, go to join subtext.com slash locked on sabers. You can get involved there. And We had a lot of good fun back and forth last night between the Sabres and the Capitals. Although there really wasn't a lot happening in that game. 41 shots combined between the two teams. Neither goaltender was tested all that much. It's kind of incredible. We got six goals out of the game, albeit uh, one at the end by Dylan Cousins was an empty netter. And then another one by Tom Wilson after the game was irrelevant. Uh, It didn't matter. So, you know. Not really much happening in the game. The most that happened was with 0.0 seconds left on the clock. And, uh, you know, again, the goals quickly to go through them. Zach Benson with a deflected goal into the back of the net. He gets the double digits, his 10th goal of the season. And Benson has had a nice year. We'll do a recap of his season uh, after the year is over. But I've liked his game all year. The scoring has not really been there. He likes to go to the front of the net despite his size, and that was a nice deflection for that goal. Alex Tuck with an outside wrist shot that Charlie Lindgren, the Capitals goaltender, probably should have saved, but finds its way through. Tuck leads the Sabres in points on the season. Jack Quinn, that was the best play of the night. Jack Quinn, toe drag to the slot, rips it past the goaltender. His eighth of the season, only in 25 games. Quinn's been awesome. Then Cousins, I mentioned, added the empty netter. But the big play or most interesting thing that happened all night in this hockey game was what happened right at the buzzer. Now I am someone that romanticizes brawls and fights in hockey. I love the Saber Senators brawl watching that back. If you go through my YouTube history, you're going to find, you know, from maybe not the last couple of days, but in the past that I'll go back and watch Hey, the Sabres and Canucks brawl from 1998. Okay, let's get a load of this. Matthew Barnaby running Sean Burke and all hell breaks loose. You know, you've got that. Uh, I'll go back and watch the Sabres and Flyers brawls where Brad May jumps in over the pile to go after Antosky. And then Matthew Barnaby jumps up and he's fighting with Gar Snow. And here comes Truffle off. Like, I love that stuff. Now, I understand why it's been phased out of the game. It's barbaric in a sport that is trying to become less and less barbaric, right, over time. So it makes sense. But when you get it and it's real and it's emotional, then then it's still fun to watch. The entertainment value of it is still there. Last night, end of the game, TJ Oshie takes a little bit of a shot at Tage Thompson with three, five seconds to go. Not much time left on the clock at all. The game's over. It's a two-goal game. There's no point to doing this at all. And Oshi is kind of scummy. He is someone that's done stuff like this throughout his entire NHL career. It's not a hard shot into the wall, but it's straight from behind. Tage Thompson, your best player. So what happens? Now, 
I'm not also someone, while I like that stuff, I'm not someone that also necessarily thinks it it has to relate to your ability to win hockey games. I don't think that it does. I think it's very far down the list of how do you become a good hockey team? This this kind of stuff is far down that list. It's not off my list, but it's very, very far down. But whatever. Who cares? Thompson gets run from behind. Here comes Rasmus Dahlin, who earlier in the day got asked by Paul Hamilton about the potential of him being the next captain. Because full expectation from everybody is that he's going to be the captain next year. And Dahlin said he's ready for it. It's, it's, it's on his mind, clearly. He's thought about it. He is ready to be the captain of this team if the opportunity arises. And what do most Sabre fans want out of their captain? In that situation, your best player has just been run from behind with the game over for no reason. What do you want your captain to do? If he's on the ice, you want him to go after that guy. And that's exactly what Darlene did. Don't, don't get stuck in a European stigma about Rasmus Darlene not being a tough player. Darlene goes right in there from center and throws Oshi to the ground with kind of use the stick a little bit too. lifts Oshi off the ground, throws him to the ice. And now here comes the cavalry. Two, three capitals are after Darlene, including I think Dylan Strom was one of them. So, all that starts breaking out. They're going after Dalene. Tage gets up, and he's got two capitals, Ovechkin and also Max Pacioretty. Tom Wilson is flown in from the offensive zone because he loves that kind of stuff. He jumps in the pile. Luckily for the Sabres, the guy that you need on the ice to, to hold Wilson back from pummeling someone in that in that situation is Jordan Greenway. Luckily, Greenway's on the ice, and Greenway catch, finds Wilson and grabs him. And those two end up fighting, as do Tage Thompson and Max Pacioretty. Now, Greenway did the best he could. Wilson's one of the best fighters in the league. He is tough. He is huge. You know, not that Greenway's not. They're probably about the same size. But Wilson wins that battle. Wilson's a better fighter than Greenway. He does it more often. Also, so whatever Greenway got a shot right at the end, right as he was falling. So wasn't like he got destroyed. Those two good on Greenway. Make sure Wilson's not going to let is not going to get to anybody else. That's Greenway's a, a deterrent in that situation. And then you got Tage. He's grabbed Max Pacioretty. Careful, Tage. That's Max Finneganoff's brother-in-law. That guy's in the family. Uh, Thompson, who's got four or five inches on Pac Pacioretty. Maybe, I don't know, maybe Pacioretty said something, or maybe he was just mad because he got hit from behind with eight seconds left for no reason, or maybe it was the frustration of the season coming out. Thompson starts raining bombs atop Max Pacioretty from above. Pacioretty, I don't think, ever even is able to throw a punch because Thompson is just wailing on him. Over the top, uppercut, six, seven, eight punches thrown by Thompson to, I don't think Pacioretty threw a single one. Thompson just raining rights upon Max Pacioretty. And you had at one moment, Dunleavy's going crazy. The crowd's going crazy. And Thompson and Greenway are fighting and they're back to back fighting at the same time in that same camera shot. So that was cool. Listen, it was, it also did the Sabres a, a service in that you had the crowd on their feet. End of the game. They won the game. It probably They probably weren't going to get booed, but to ensure, just ensure, that the crowd reaction to them saluting the crowd at the end of the game was going to be favorable, getting into that brawl at the end did that. By the way, I'm willing to call it a brawl. I'll go above scrum. I don't know where Donnybrook also falls in on this, or skirmish, scuffle. I think it's near brawl status because scrum... Scrum is a lot of pushing and shoving, throwing punches with your gloves on, maybe throwing guys to the ice. Gloves don't really come off in scrums, I don't think. And if they do, maybe it's one part. When you've got multiple fights going on at the same time, while everybody else on the ice is involved in something else, all 10 players on the ice are involved in something, and there's two fights going on, that's a, that's a brawl, in my opinion. One other thing on that fight at the end, I had this conversation with Sal Capaccio on the Extra Point Show in WGR today. Uh, was Uka Pekalukanen supposed to come out and, and grab somebody? Because 
extra attacker on the ice for Washington. It's six on five. And one thing I've always remembered about Ryan Miller, Ryan Miller would jump right into that stuff if he needed to. Ryan Miller in Vancouver once threw the gloves down to defend a rookie that was being attacked by Matt Martin with the Sabres. I think it's game two of the Boston series in 2010. At the end of the game, Chara is going at it with McCormick, Reve, and Gostad all at the same time. Boston was down in that game. They had an extra attacker out there. That scrum starts. Miller, without hesitation, r- jumps out of his crease and goes to, to grab Miroslav Shatan. And him and Shatan start pushing and shoving along the wall. Miller never had a hesitation about that. Lukanen didn't come out of the net. Here's why I don't think, like, there's no blame on Lukanen, though, at all. There's no reason to blame Lukanen. If all six capitals on the ice had been involved, then I would want Lukanen to go in there. And I don't even to fight, just grab somebody so that one of your teammates isn't, go, you know, going two on one. But go watch that, the, the fight's back. Alex Ovechkin's not doing anything. Alex Ovechkin's just hanging out on the side like, I'm too old for this bleep. Uh, I've got a playoffs to rest up for. I got a goals record that I'm trying to save energy for. I don't need to be getting into this at the end of the game. Ove- especially Ovechkin probably knew, right? He's smart. He probably knows, like, I don't need to get into this. It's five on five. Everybody's got a dance partner. I don't need to, I don't need to get involved here. So, you know, Lukanen probably sees Ovechkin standing off to the side, not doing anything. And, you know, it's not worth talking about at that point. But I think protocol for goalies. I don't know how many do this, but if it's extra attackers and a scrum starts, you better get involved. If I'm the coach, I'm telling you that you better get into it because our, if one of our teammates has got to go two on one because you didn't come out of your net, that's, that's not a good thing. Like I like breaking down brawls, you know, I would have loved doing that back in the day. If I was doing this podcast back in the nineties with Ted Nolan teams, by the way, there was a Ted Nolan sign in the arena. I don't know what the hell was going on there. There was a huge Ted Nolan sign that only got unveiled at the end of that game. I don't know what was happening there. Listen, this gets to an overall conversation about are the Sabres tough enough? Let's explore that. When we come back, are the Buffalo Sabres tough enough? Because I see that said a lot, and I agree with half of it, if that makes sense. I'll explain when we come back here in the Locked On Sabres podcast. We are presented here on the show by Policy Genius. Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace. It saves you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net starting today. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Have you ever gotten positive feedback uh, or policy genius helps you compare your options from top companies and their team of licensed experts is on hand to help talk you through it. Talk to a team of award-winning agents who will walk you through the process step-by-step. Your work life insurance policy may not offer enough protection for your family needs. Even worse, it may not come with you if you leave your job. Check life insurance off your to-do list in no time with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash locked on NHL or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you save. That's policygenius.com slash locked on NHL. Back here on the Locked On Sabres podcast, they can make us your first listen every day. Be sure to check out Locked On Sports today. It's a free podcast available on YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, or wherever you may be listening to this on all things sports. With all the playoffs coming up, NBA, NHL, you've got football offseason, a lot's going on uh, right now. Are the Sabres tough enough? Get said a lot. It will always get said about a team that loses, though, won't it? Won't a team that loses consistently always get that criticism that's part of this but let's go beyond that here's why i will not listen to from here until the start of next year that they've got to get tougher if if that's the word you're using if you want to say tougher to play against i think that's different tougher in general do we think this team doesn't defend itself when it needs to i mean you might want it to happen more often. You want them to be engaged, right? When you say tougher, really, that's what you mean, I think. You want them to be engaged emotionally in the game. And if someone is doing something 
to, to disrespect your team or to go after a teammate, you know, get in there, do something about it. For the most part, I feel like this team does do that. And I don't think they have guys that shy away from it. Look at their best players. Find me the guy that shies away from extracurricular stuff. You know, whether it comes to pushing and shoving after the whistle or throwing hits or fighting if need be. Like, Thompson, he gets in that fight last night with Pacioretty. Thompson's been in fights before. Thompson, is HockeyFights.com still a thing? Because it used to be. And they used to keep track of players and how often they would fight. Um, so I don't know if they have Thompson. I guess they do. And they already got last night's fight in there. Thompson has one, two, three, four, five, six fights in the NHL. That's more than I would have thought. So if he's got to drop the gloves, he'll do it. Alex Tuck, if he's got to drop the glove, if he's got to defend a teammate, he'll do it for sure. Alex Tuck has he fought Brady Kachuk earlier in the season. Remember that? Um, who else? Dylan Cousins tried to fight the entire Toronto Maple Leafs once upon a time in the Heritage Classic. Darlene got cross-tracked in the neck, and what did Cousins do? He ran Austin Matthews and then fought uh, after someone came after him. So Cousins will do it. Um, Darlene will certainly do it. He's going to be the captain, and you want him to do that too, but Darlene's the guy that goes in there and starts that whole ruckus last night. Oh, she's the guy who hits Thompson from behind, but then Darlene roars in from center, drops Oshi, and Darlene's been known to get his stuff like that all the time. And if you want to talk about toughness, that dude throws the most bone crushing hits on the team. Rasmus Darlene does. So not him, even the some of the smaller guys. Skinner. Skinner's a finesse player. Skinner got suspended last year for cross checking a dude in the teeth, and he was doing it to defend his goaltender. Remember, Jake Gensel slashed at Craig Anderson at the end of the game and Skinner went after the guy. He went too far with it. That's why he got suspended. He cross-checked the guy in the face. Um, but Skinner does stuff like that all the time. You know, I think the only guy you could point to for this, and this is going to happen maybe his whole career, that you ha- I think you would be correct in saying this dude's not as tough as I want him to be. I will not listen to it on Darlene. I will not listen to it on Thompson or Tuck or Skinner or – Cousins or a lot of these guys. Power is going to be the guy for that. Fans are going to want more out of power his whole career for that. I won't care personally. It's not my type of thing that everybody's got to be like that. Power is his own individual. He doesn't like to play like that, whatever. Um, But there are going to be people that want power to be more physical and tougher his entire career. But he's the only guy. He's the only guy, unless Krebs even, like Krebs gets into stuff. Let me know if I'm missing someone, but I think power is the only one that you could even possibly have a problem with. The bigger issue I have on are the Sabres tough? Mental toughness. Mental toughness. You're Thompson the other night, letting stuff get to you at this season. And from outside noise, what are you talking about? The The ability to play with pressure. You guys can't play with pressure. There's this mental stuff that, I think the, I, mental toughness is where I would I would levy my criticism against the Sabres. All in all, though, for me, it doesn't really matter to whether or not they're good or not. I mean, it's again, it's on my list, but it's not the number one thing. My bigger issue right now is I don't know if they have a one-two center punch that's talented enough. Talented enough. Talent comes first for me. I know for other people are different, but talent's first for me. Are the Sabres tough enough? Physically, I'd answer yes. Mentally, I think I would answer no, at least for the foreseeable future. When we come back, we've got – we're going to push off the Sabres awards a little bit because I want to do more with that. Uh, maybe we'll do that over the weekend. Uh, the sorties are uh, voted on by our listeners, whether it's a texter or a tweeter, and uh, we'll have different awards that I'm going to be giving out to Sabres players for the year. Uh, I want to talk about the Arizona Coyotes, though, when we come back. I have not gotten in on this yet. What's happening in Arizona – Salt Lake about to come into the NHL. There's a lot happening on that front, and I've got a lot of opinions on it. We'll get to that when we come back here on the Locked on Sabres podcast. We are presented here on the show by Indeed. When you're drafting your fantasy team, never wish you could just handpick the best players. If you're building your talent roster, you could do that, and you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire 
all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like matching assessments and virtual interviews. If you hate waiting, Indeed's U.S. data shows over 80% of Indeed employers find quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. Indeed, uh, join over 3 million businesses worldwide using Indeed to hire great talent fast. Does the hardworking hiring for you. Sponsor a job. They'll match you with quality candidates right away. Indeed knows when you're growing your own business, you can make every dollar. You have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Visit Indeed.com slash locked on to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash locked on. Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application. Pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. This episode of the Locked On Savers podcast also brought to you by Factor. Eat fresh, free, eat stress-free this spring with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian approved and ready-to-eat in just two minutes. Choose from a weekly menu of 35% of 35 options, excuse me, including popular options like calorie smart, keto, protein plus, or vegan and veggie. Also discover more than 60 add-ons every week, like breakfast on the, uh, go on the go lunch, uh, snacks, beverages to stay, uh, help you stay fueled and feel good all day long. What are you waiting for? Get started today. Fuel up your springtime goals. Head to factormeals.com slash locked on NHL 50 and use the code locked on NHL 50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. You get a discount on the first two. That's code locked on NHL 50 at factormeals.com slash Locked on NHL 50. Same code word, same for the URL to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. Final segment here in the Locked On Sabres podcast. If you your first listen every day, the Arizona Coyotes appear to be on their way out of Arizona. At long last, the NHL's longest nightmare is over. And I want to preface this with saying I do feel for whatever amount of Arizona Coyote fans there are. And I know it's not a lot. I mean, it is the smallest, it is the, the least supported team in hockey for the last 20 years. It's not all their fault, the fans, right? Like, they've never had a team that was worth cheering for. That team, look at their seasons, man. Like, when were they good? They made the conference finals one time where I believe they lost to the, uh, it was either Chicago or LA. But going back to, I mean, the Sabres drought, they've only made the playoffs. Well, I guess they made it three times, but it's only one time in the last 11 years. And they lost in the first round that one time that they got there. Um, They've just never been a, uh, never been a, a consistently good hockey team the whole time they've been in Phoenix or Scottsdale, Glendale, wherever the hell they end up. and. It's more than that, though. It's not about the fans, right? It's not about the team. It's about the support of the area. That team has never been wanted there. Look at how the governments act. The 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 Glendale Town Council that denied arena stuff all the time from Arizona. Get out of here. They kicked them out, and then they ended up in a college rink, borrowing a space from Arizona State. And... Here they are trying to win this land auction, right? That's coming up in June to build their own arena. And the mayor of Scottsdale is like, we don't want you here. We don't want you to win this auction. We don't want you to do this. No one in Arizona seems to have, no one with power in Arizona seems to want the Coyotes to stay. And as hard as Gary Bettman has tried to make that market work since 1996, it hasn't. Gary's got to take the L. On this one, at least temporarily, he's got to take the L. And finally, he realized it. After over a decade of, are they going to stay? Do they have an arena? Uh Uh-oh, we need a new owner. Well, this owner wants to move him to Hamilton, but we want him in Arizona, so let's get a different owner. I mean, how many owners they've had? How many arena projects they've had? It's just nonstop, year after year, with the Coyotes. It never, ever ends with the Coyotes. And finally, Bettman in the NHL said, enough's enough. And also, 
they got lucky because they have no plan past Arizona State. But the NHL, they don't want to realign. So they don't want to go throw a team in Quebec because now the Eastern Conference is unbalanced and now Detroit, they want to go back to the West and Detroit doesn't want to go back to the West. There's just, there's a lot of headaches there. So you kind of need a team that makes sense geographically and you need an owner that fully is invested in bringing an NHL team to the market. That's where Houston, I think, has sometimes fallen short is there's been interest in Houston. But I, to my knowledge, I've never seen like an all-in effort to get a team to Houston. I think that will happen someday though. But here comes Ryan Smith. Billionaire, Salt Lake City. I want a team in Salt Lake City. I, I'm all in on this. And Salt Lake City is not even that far away from Phoenix. I mean, at least, you know, comparatively speaking to other potential markets, it's not far at all. You could keep divisions the same. You could keep conferences the same. They have the ability to get a new arena. They have a temporary, a temporary arena, too. So Salt Lake City checks all the boxes Except for, it's not the big, sexy market that Bettman likes. Bettman likes the Met to go after the high ceiling, the max amount of revenue possible. And because he's a business guy and he runs a corporation and a business and that's how they act. They care about their bottom line. Why have they always wanted Houston? Why are they always flirting with Houston? Because Houston's like the second biggest city in the United States. And because they have that many people... That's that's dollars. The more people, the more money in pockets, the more uh, or the more money in general out there, the more team for an NHL team to, 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 to grab. So that's why he's always wanted Houston. That's why he wanted Phoenix. Phoenix is a massive market. I think it's seventh in the United States. That's the one box Salt Lake City doesn't check. It's not a big city at all. I think it's 41st in the country. Um, it's not going to check that box. But if it does every other box, arena, You'll get fan support. They support the Utah Jazz well, very well in the NBA. Um, it's not far away. It's in the Western Conference. It could be in the Western Conference still. It could be in the same division. And they have a guy that wants them there. Salt Lake City is the easy answer here. So now, though, part of this deal is Alex Morello, the Coyotes owner, will sell the team to the NHL, then they'll sell them to Ryan Smith. Morello gets exclusive rights over an expansion team in Arizona over the next five years. That might sound like, okay, well, they're still committed. They they are, right? Bettman is not giving up. He wants to make Arizona work. Here's why I don't think it's going to happen. Why am I to think that after 10 to 15 years of arena drama, that in the next five, they're going to figure it out? They're not, and maybe they would. The only way is if they do win this land auction in June, the coyotes. And then they somehow get the budgeting, the money to build their arena complex. And then that will take about three years. And in three years time, maybe we are talking about the return of the coyotes. That to me might be their only play. I don't know what else they do. I don't, maybe there's another a town, but Glendale, Scottsdale, Phoenix, like none of these places want them. So I don't know where they're going to go. Maybe they try a different city in Arizona. Maybe they try Tucson or something, or or I don't know, uh, Flagstaff. Maybe love Flagstaff. I've been there, but um, I just I don't see it. I don't see them coming back. I don't think the Coyotes will return. I think this is it. I think this is the final season of Arizona Coyotes hockey. I could be wrong on whether they come back at some point, but it's definitely going to be the final season before they go to Salt Lake. Team names are also going to be fun to talk about, though, for Salt Lake. My favorite by far is the Salt Lake Stags. We don't have enough deer teams in sports. We got the Milwaukee Bucks, and like that's pretty much it. Give me the Salt Lake Stags. It rolls off the tongue. A little alliteration there. You get the Stags is a nice hockey team name, right? Um, you know, it, it just, I don't know, it fits. I saw a mock-up jersey concept where the colors are kind of green and orange a little bit, which is not too far off from the Coyotes now. And you got the, the deer as the logo. I'm all in on Salt Lake Stags. The worst one would be the Utah Yeti. I also saw that one out there. The Utah Yeti would be the worst team name ever. So stupid. 
if they do that. Uh, they're the Beehive State. Maybe they do something with the Hive or maybe the Salt Lake Stingers is an option for them. Those are some of the ones I've seen. Let me know if you've got an idea for the new Salt Lake NHL team name, what your favorite is. And uh, I'll, I'm will i going to check through some of your, your answers and see if anyone could beat Salt Lake Stags. That's my favorite. All right, Sabres, final couple of games here, both on the road. Saturday against Florida, Monday against Tampa, both on the road. We will see what we get in those games. Maybe we get some of the kids called up. Rochester is can clinch stuff tonight. Uh, so if they're playing for nothing in their final couple of AHL games, then why not just call Kulik and Roseanne up for the final two Sabre games? We'll see what they do. Thanks for listening today here on the Lockdown Sabres podcast. We'll have our Sorty Award show coming up in our next episode, so stay tuned for that. And we will talk to you after the next game, Sabres and Panthers, tomorrow on Saturday night. Thanks for listening here on Lockdown Sabres, the Lockdown Sabres podcast. Check out Lockdown Sports today. NBA, NHL, NFL, Major League Baseball, it's all available. Check it out on YouTube or the Amazon Fire TV channels app.